Studios. KLOK proudly presents to you the prominent attorney Shaw Perel for the Shaw Perel and Law Show, coming at you with over 50,000 watts of power. The Shaw Perel and Law Show, where all your views matter. Hello, 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 everybody. Assalamualaikum, Sastikal, Namaskar to all our listeners. This is attorney Shah Parali for the Shah Parali Law Show. And, of course, we're going to discuss about immigration law and also some debt settlement, but, of course, a lot about immigration law as usual. And uh, the, the studio line now will be open in a few minutes. And today I have with me Franco. Thank you, Franco, for being here. And thank you, Akeloke, for bringing us again on, on the on this studio. And for the new listeners, just to let you know, this uh, we have been doing this show now almost going on eight years. In, in two months, it will be, I think in three months, it will be eight years. So I wanted to thank you all. Uh, first of all, anything I'm telling you today is for educational purposes only. You should not act or refrain to act solely on the information provided. You should contact an attorney if you have any questions. And if you have um, if you have any questions for today, the studio line is 408-912-5565. 408-912-5565. And today, of course, we're going to start. Um, there is a visa bulletin uh, came out and it's been coming. Uh, it's been um, out for a while. We know that EB1 got retrogressed. Uh, next month is retrogressing, but that doesn't mean you cannot file your EB1. By the way, you will still probably be able to file for the adjustment of status and the EAD, but you won't get the green card immediately. But at least we have that in hand. So for those who qualify for EB1 or who want at least to uh, to to check what is um, uh, an EB1 and I mean check if they do qualify for it, feel free to call our office at 510-7425887. I'm going to fo- uh, focus today on EB1 uh, because that one b season is almost finished now. So. Uh, we have another couple of weeks, so it will be off. But we, we're still taking some cases. I think we still have time maybe to take some cases till by tomorrow, Monday. So feel free to call our office if you need to do your H-1B, 510 And uh, today I'm, I'm going to focus mostly on on the issues with EB-1. And um, for those who, who don't know what is the EB-1, you, we have uh, very, very good articles on our website. PiratiLaw.com or AttorneyOnAir.com, AttorneyOnAir.com, and um, also if you need help with anything else, please feel free to reach out to us, uh, 510-742-5887, again, AttorneyOnAir.com, AttorneyOnAir.com, and um, Franco, I think we have one caller, let me take the caller and then we'll talk about EB1, this is Sharp Rai, you are live in air. Uh, uh, hi, uh, thanks for taking my call. Uh, I have a, a, one quick question uh, uh, for my friend. Yeah, my mm-hmm. friend's parent visa is expired eight months ago. Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. uh, visitor visa. Uh, can they yes. still use the Dropbox facility for renewal of visitor visa? You mean it's it's uh, expired? I don't think the visitor visa they they allow them to do on Dropbox, but I have to double check on that. Most of the time for H1B stuff like that, they allow that. But for visitor visa, especially long time it has been expired, they might call them. When you apply for it uh, on the DS-160, they will tell you if you're eligible. But as far as I know, I I don't have any recall that they allow that. So I'm not sure on that. I have to double check myself, okay? But uh, when you file the DS-160, you should know. Yeah, continuation of that question. My friend, H-1B petition is valid only for six months. Is it better to mm. go for visitor visa stamping after H-1B extension approval? Or is it okay to go before that? Can you please uh, share your advice? Um, I. What do you mean his H-1B is only six months and he's traveling outside, right? So he wants no, to come back. No, he's not traveling. He is uh, here only. Uh, he is planning to apply uh, visitor visa extension, uh, uh, I mean visitor visa uh, stamping mm. so before that. So is it okay, okay he or doesn't or ha- he okay doesn't okay ha- he doesn't he doesn't have any I-140? Oh, he has I-140, yes. Okay, but he doesn't have any job or anything, right, to extend it? That's no, he, he has a job and he has 140, but uh, 
His question is, uh, he has to wait until uh, he will get the uh, H-1B extension approval or uh, is it okay to apply for visitor visa okay, uh, extension? Not, oh, why would he apply for the visitor visa if he has an I-140 and he has a job? No, 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 not for him. Uh, uh, this is my continuation of the previous question. So for his parents, their visa got expired, yeah. Visa. Yeah, the visa got expired. They have to reapply for the visa. There's no extension of the visa. So I'm um, I'm a little bit confused about your question. Uh, no, yeah, uh, yeah. Let me uh, clarify. So they have to apply for the visa. Uh, the question mm-hmm. is, uh, his uh, H-1B uh, is going to expire in six months. Uh, and okay. He's planning to so apply for the extension. Okay. The the parents are here in the U.S. I guess he is in the US and he has a job. No, no, no. Hub. Oh, he's applying for extension and he wants to know if his parents can apply for the visitor visa. He should apply now or wait when his extension is applied, right? Exactly. Okay, now I understand because I was confusing with extension. Sorry, sorry for the confusion. Okay, no, 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 it's not your fault. So, no. First of all, the B-1 is not related to the H-1. The only part that is related is if they are filing the I-134, which is uh, the support, affidavit of support. But apart from that, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not really helpful um, in a way or the other. But, of course, if he's putting the I-134, they will ask, hey, how long you have the visa? But it doesn't matter when they file because the most important part in the visa visa is if they have the means to pay for their their their, their stay and their travel, and also uh, if they they satisfy 214B, that means they they are going to have the intent to go back. So as long as you you make this happen, you should be fine. Okay. Got it. Thank you so much. Good luck to you. Good luck. Okay. Sorry for that confusion. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is Attorney Shapir Ali again, and you can call the number to the studio today is four zero eight nine one two five five six five. I will try my best to answer your questions. Sometimes it gets confusing because <laughs> the terms we use sometimes is tricky, but I apologize again for that. So, uh, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about EB one A because this is something that a lot of people are asking, and we're doing a lot of cases of EB one A and. And I'm very proud to say that we we are getting very, a very high success rate there, and we are we we have a very good team handling that. So um, today I'm, I'm I'm talking a little bit about about the situation um, of the of uh, of the H1B, uh, I mean the EB1A, and I'm hoping that I will get uh, Attorney Sharif to join us. But uh, right now I don't know if he's he's available. But uh, so what what we can do is um we're going to talk a little bit about it and then from there we will we will we will have him join us so um let's let's uh let's talk a little bit about about the issue with the eb1 who qualifies and what we need to do uh so what we what we want to talk about today uh is um is when can you get an eb1 of course who can apply um you you can apply if you can show that you are of an extraordinary ability in science arts education business or athletics and you are of national or international acclaim and that's where it gets confusing the first stuff itself because people don't understand really what it means because they think basically okay you have to win those big big awards and have those big big publications to qualify the answer is no because uh, bottom line is um, uh, we are we are in a situation where basically, if you can show that you are you have contributed to the to the um, to the extraordinary ability, you have contributed in your field, you might be able to qualify for an EB1A. And EB1A, the advantage of it is you don't have to have an employer to get in. And also, you can actually file for an EB1A even when you uh, um, when you have a, a situation where you think you don't have um, publications. Because a lot of people call me, and I've always been on the side that you have to have publications, but it's not really true. And again, I, I hope I will have Attorney Sharif down the road to talk a little bit about that. And um, and also. We are going to talk about about how, what what makes a good case of EB1. Uh, one of there are few tests, right? Out of those f- 
uh, 10 tests, you have to meet three of them, right? And uh, this is where, again, it becomes confusing because people think, okay, how do you meet that? Oh, I don't meet one, so I'm out. No, it's sometimes you can combine uh, different, different uh, criteria to make one. So, for example, um, uh, one of the things that they ask is, have you received any uh, lesser nationally or internationally any uh, recognized prizes or awards for excellence in the field of endeavor? So many times people come to us and ask, hey, I, I didn't receive this award, so how will I qualify? Well, sometimes you, you don't need it because you have something else, right? Uh, for example, are you a member of an association that requires outstanding achievements to be a member? That doesn't mean you have to be a Nobel Prize winner or something like that to be qualifying uh, to look at the first part of it. And then you don't have to have um, always been, um, been a, if you have, you have been a member of a big uh, association. So I think I will have Sharif, um, I'm going to take a quick break, uh, Franco, because I, hopefully I'll have Sharif call on and, and the other line because he's the one who's handling all that and I want him to speak a little bit about the kind of cases we're getting in the office. So we're going to take a quick break and then just to merge him hopefully and then and then after that we will come back because I really want to talk about EB1. It's very, very important because a lot of people are calling and asking questions. So we'll be glad to help you. So uh, the, uh, the, the question that we, we are asking today is EB1A and I will ask uh, uh, Franco to hold on the, the, all the other uh, callers until we finish with Sharif. So hopefully he will call in one or two minutes. So we'll take a quick break just for me to merge that and then we will be back after those messages, okay? Beerables Inc. is an e-solutions company that provides custom web design, web application development, and internet marketing services to individuals and businesses. They can build powerful e-commerce sites, mobile apps, develop content, and market you on social media. They can help manage your brand's reputation and provide rock-solid customer support. Call today at 1-800-651-6091 or email us at info at for a free consultation today. Again, the number is 1-800-651-6091. If you own a property and have a second mortgage on it, and if you want to keep this property and get rid of the second loan, attorney Shaw Perali can help. Call 510-742-5887. Due to the uncertain economy, many people have settled their debts for a fraction of its value. It's recommended to use an experienced lawyer to deal with it. Shaw Perali is an experienced debt settlement attorney and has handled hundreds of such cases successfully. Successfully. There are no upfront fees for debt settlement. Only when you win, you pay. Call Shaw Perali, attorney at law, at 510-742-5887 or visit YourDebtSettlementAttorney.com for a free assessment. This is just an advertisement. No attorney-client relationship is established by this ad. The law does not guarantee success. Call 510-742-5887. Hey, good afternoon, Tushar. Thanks for a very good show. Thank you for the show and all the information that you're providing. Hi, Tushar Thank you so much. Hi, uh, Mr. Tushar. Thanks for uh, doing this program. Hi, Shah. Thank you. Uh, hi, Shah. Thanks for picking up my call. Uh, hi, Shah. My name is Kunal. Uh, let me thank you for this wonderful show. It's been a tremendous help, actually. Mr. Shatrali, thanks for sharing the information. Good afternoon, sir. I would like to congratulate you. It's a wonderful show and lots of people are getting benefited in different areas like immigration and settlement and all. Yeah, good afternoon. So, first of all, thank you very much for providing all this uh, useful information. Really appreciate it. I've been listening to your shows. Uh, I know I'm, I've been listening to your shows only on Mondays, but I, 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 from now on I'll try to make it point, listen to it, you know, the other days also. Thank you for doing such a great show. Thank you. Thank you for taking my call. It's a wonderful welcome. show. Hi, Mr. Shah. Uh, I appreciate your talk show and a daily listener uh, of this, and it's very informative. Yeah, hi, Shah. Uh, hi. Thank you for taking my call. Hi, Rajesh. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for taking my call, and first of all, uh, thank you very much for your great service to the community. Thanks. Sure, thanks for keeping up the current situation. Uh, it's unfortunate. So, 
So we're back ladies and gentlemen and we ha- I had to cut it because I wanted to have Sharif online. Sharif is an attorney in our office. He 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 usually works from the um, from the Sun- uh, Washington DC office, but today we have him luckily with us in the Bay Area, so I'm hoping I can get him online and and we'll talk a little bit about EB1 because nobody's better in a better position to talk about EB1. So let me see Sharif, are you there? Uh, yeah, I'm here. How are you, how are you doing attorney Shah? I'm doing well. I'm doing well, Sharif. So, Sharif, tell us before we start. Tell us quickly about yourself and uh, and uh, your uh, your credentials quickly, and then also about uh, some of the cases you have you have worked on. Sure, sure. Well, I come from a, a, a both a business and legal background, and um, have uh, completed my studies at the University of Pacific New George, and um, am, am an attorney practicing in uh, Washington as well as, uh, you know, doing immigration cases all over the country, as you know. Um, you know, our focus has, has really been to help those individuals that have been stuck in the uh, EB2Q. It's um, a, a matter, I think, of justice, you know, looking at the situation, seeing so many talented, wonderful people that can make important contributions to, to this country um, that, you know, that are being uh, discriminated against uh, based on their country of origin. So, um, you know, I've put my energy, my effort, and uh, legal knowledge into developing solutions for those folks. And, you know, hopefully we could, um, you know, we've had great, you know, thank, thank goodness, unbelievable success in that regard. And, um, you know, that's something we, we hope to continue as long as necessary. And, and also just a general, you know, business practice, um, you know, helping set up companies whether it's a, a company that's in the Middle East or in South Asia that's looking to, um, you know, set up in the United States and move over their uh, managerial or executive team, um, and uh, and just just overall doing doing our best to to make people's lives more comfortable and uh, and and better. So, so that's what we're here to do, you know, under your guidance, of course, and um, you know that that's that's really been inspirational. So so I appreciate the opportunity being here. Well, now at this point, I think you know a lot more than me with an EB1. So I wanted to thank you for that, and the, the success rate has been amazing. We have pretty much almost, I would say, almost a hundred percent now since you came in, and I really appreciate that. And I wanted you to. Uh, there are a lot of questions that people ask an EB1. What will you tell an engineer or our listeners that are listening here? Can they get an EB1A? Because we are talking about EB1A here, where you don't need an employer. To, to file, so can you tell them uh, if if it is that hard? Because a lot of them think it's very very hard to obtain it. Can you tell them? I know the answer, but I want to hear it from you. How difficult it is and how possible it is. So to 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 create to to do those cases. Sure, sure. Um, you know, it is a, a challenging area of the law. There, there's no doubt about it. We shouldn't be naive or think that you know it's something that's going to be extremely straightforward. Um, at the same time, I, I, it's, it's very possible, it's, it's doable, and I think one common uh, misconception, uh, lack of understanding that I see amongst individuals is they, uh, they don't um, appreciate their accomplishments enough. Because for people that come, particularly for India, I think it's, you know, we could focus on that because that's where there's a lot of need because of the EB2 backlog. You know, to come into the United States to make, you know, in the range, m- most people in the high 90s or, you know, 100,000 uh, um, plus range of salary to work in a, you know, a, a, at a very high level doing really, really important projects for, you know, important companies, whether it's in a, whether it's in a consulting role or directly employed by, you know, a lot of the major important companies in the U.S. is no uh, easy task. It's, it's a, you, you look at the, the majority of um, you know, American citizens that are born and raised in this country, and, and they have done nothing near what a lot of folks from India have come to this country and accomplished. So it's, it's really about polishing off those accomplishments, presenting it in the proper manner, and 
explaining to the adjudicating officer how and why this person meets the criteria. I think one thing that we do too much of is get caught up in the, um, you know, does this person meet three criterion um, of the ten criterion listed on the USCIS website? And, of course, that's really, really important. But m I think more important than that is the person needs to have the correct theme, the correct explanation of how they're going to benefit the country. And then we look deeply into their profile and try to extract and determine whether, uh, you know, those, those criterion uh, may be met. So, so just to give a quick example, if you have a person that, that maybe, um, you know, has, has done peer review um, and has um, maybe a, a lesser national award and also some, you know, pretty decent salary, they may say, look, I meet the three criteria. Um, but you, that alone will not get someone approved um, because they, they, what you, they really, really need is a strong explanation of how they're going to really benefit this country, how they're going to continue to work in this their area, and how that, you know, you, you almost have to put the um, adjudicating officer in a position where they, they can't deny the case because it's, you know, so important to the country. So in order to do that, you really need somebody with, I think, talent and ability in terms of the legal analysis to, to, to really make that case. Then the next question, which is uh, a lot of people ask us, uh, Sharif, is do you need publications to to make it to the EB1A? No, no, you, you do not need publications. That's that's Because some jobs don't require you to have publications or some professions don't require you to have publications. So if you look at the requirements of EB1A, I think um, you know, a person is able to demonstrate extraordinary ability in different aspects. It could be extraordinary ability in business. So um, what, what that will be measured by is not publications. It will be measured by how much business and revenue you've been able to generate or economic impact you've had in the country. So that has absolutely nothing to do with publications. Um, it, I would argue, and I look back at uh, success stories over and over and what we've done right and you know where we could have, do better, um, I, I think that there are two really important things that one needs in order to qualify for uh, EP1A. And that is that they have um, an original contribution of major significance that you look at your, your professional profile and you say to yourself and you know, to your attorney, what are the two or three most important things that I've done in my career? Take those things, polish them off, see how it's impacted the business, see how it's impacted folks around you, and use that to, to launch your EB1A petition. The, uh, the second thing I think is really important is that you're employed in an important role. You're employed in either a critical or a leading role um, and for an organization of distinguished reputation, and that, that has its own analysis. Um, but I think having one of those two things would be, uh, you know, uh, really, really important. And then I would say that those, I would put those at the top, and then things like publications, whether you can done peer review or judge the work of others, whether you have a, a salary, or other criterion would would also would help um, you know propel those, but you really have to you know have on the forefront of an EB1A petition. In my estimation, um, original contributions of major significance to me is, is the most important criteria. So now let us people want to know what um, that's very important without violating any confidentiality. What is the most interesting and what kind of case you, we have been successful on you? I think so far we have taken a bunch of them. I, I don't want to, I don't even know how many because in the past one year we have been focusing a lot on that. But uh, if you can pick some of the cases which were the most interesting and the most uh, juicy, I should call it, uh, can you give us a little bit quick facts and how, how it happened and we made it uh, happen? Sure, sure. Yeah, I could do that. I think, um, I, I think if it's okay with you, if you could bear with me, I'd like to give you two examples. Um, because I think it helps illustrate how one becomes successful. Uh, you know, one would be uh, a person that uh, was in a, uh, a, a post-doctoral uh, um, role. So, uh, you know, uh, he or she wasn't really making a huge amount of money. Um, you know, she had some uh, publications, but mainly this person was doing, uh, you know, clinical research. So with clinical research, you don't have a huge amount of publications. Um, but 
they're working at a really good organization, a really good university. But the key for this person, and I think the reason why they were approved without any RFE, without any hassle within you know, 12, 13 days, was they worked so hard themselves to get the support, to get the um, you know, people within her community, um, with the community of you know, uh, academics, to support her case. And that really um, put her forward above other candidates. Um, so it's it, a lot of it just really depends on, on, on how hard uh, you work. Um, you know, other ones, for instance, um, you know, we've done like accountants, so people that are that are really proficient in accounting. Um, so different professions that you wouldn't even you know think of, um, you know, whether it's athletes or accountants or you know, um, so many you know engineers. Um, you know, one that comes to mind was a uh, a software architect who. Uh, Created, you know, applications that were being implemented by companies and agencies in the country, and it, you know, basically to her, it was like, look, I developed this application because it's my job. But to me, it's like, wow, you developed an application that people are using and are benefiting from, and it's streamlining operations at this company and saving that company, you know, uh, uh, millions of dollars. Let's let's run with it. This is huge. So it's it's just mm-hmm. about you know. Uh, you know, highlighting the facts. But uh, let me just give you the reverse example. A reverse example, you know, without I, I, without revealing where, I could say was this person worked at the most important scientific government institution in the country. This person was basically, you could say, a rocket scientist. However, they did not work hard on developing the petition. You know, asking for, for things, asking for things, you know, uh, these people, they, they, they came in with maybe a more uh, overconfident attitude. And despite, you know, our legal advice, you know, they, 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 they came with um, refusing to kind of give the evidence that, that our guidance is suggesting. And, and that person, you know, did not get uh, approved as easily. They had to go through different, you know, RFEs and processes. So my point for saying this is, if you follow proper legal advice and legal legal guidance, and you meet the statutory requirements under the law, you will be approved. You have to just meet. You have to meet the statute. What does the law say? Meet the legal requirements. Get approved. If you don't meet the legal requirements, even if you're Albert Einstein, you're not going to be approved. You have yes, to demonstrate yeah, have. the things that are required under the law. I, I get kind of. Uh excited on this because a lot of people think it's just plug it in and unfortunately it's not we have seen many cases where people try on their own because they are focusing so much on the facts and they are not focusing also on the law the case is moot and then they end up by getting either a huge RFE and they can't answer or they end up by losing the case and there's the same case if we have taken it it would have probably I'm not saying guarantee of course but been approved because ultimately uh, the law is combined with the facts and that's where i think a biggest mistake is done and that's why now more and more people are contacting us and we are getting people all over the world just to let you know and uh, sharif knows that we are pretty much i think we have people from europe people from canada people from from india pakistan uh, you name it uh, coming to us now and uh, we had uh, we had some very very interesting cases also in the past where the attorneys told them they couldn't get it done, but still we took it and we got it done. So sometimes we make the call and sometimes we let the client make the call, but ultimately if you don't run it, at least let us kind of assess it, you will not know. And I think most of the cases we are getting are not easy cases, right, Sharif? We are getting people who are right want us to to make it happen and, and hopefully, and we I think that we'll, there's one case which was very interesting where we, we were not sure, but we still went ahead, right? Uh, about this computer engineer, I think, right? So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. She she told me any... actually she was refused by eleven attorneys that they told her you're crazy, you're wasting your money, your your whoever will take your case is just trying to, you know, make some money. Which obviously that's not the situation. We have you know more business than we can ever ask for. Um, but uh, this person was in, you know, this country for for seventeen years and said to me, look, this is my last shot. If I don't you know, uh, get this approved and going back to India. And I told her, you know, look, you have a difficult case, but at the end of the day, we'll, we'll do everything we can to help you. And, uh, and you know, thank goodness, 
um, you know, she, she, she had some really, you know, good applications that she developed, which she didn't understand how important they were. We were able to polish them off, you know, with, with proper uh, evidence. Because a lot of times the evidence with regard to original contribution of major significance, first of all, the, the contribution must be original. Like it has to be something that you developed yourself. And also it has to have uh, major significance. So those are two separate analyses. You can't just, you know, throw it out there as if, look, I did this, it's original contribution. No, you have to analyze it. Why is it original? I developed it myself. It didn't previously exist. Here's the evidence for that. Here's the, you know, proof of this. Here's the person that's making this statement, testifying that this is originally my work and that um, other folks were only involved in it in a support function. Then you need to talk about how is it a major significance, uh, of major significance. It's of major significance because other individuals have benefited from it. Who has benefited from it? How have they benefited from it? We get support letters, we get evidence, we get, you know, uh, material demonstrating independent, documented, existing evidence to show that it's of major significance. So it's, um, you know, it's a double analysis on original contribution of major significance. Just like with critical capacity in the organization of distinguished reputation, okay, you work in a critical role, you perform in a critical role, and you've got to look at the statutory language now. It's, it doesn't say employed in a critical role. It says that you perform in a critical role. What that tells me, and this is where we've been very successful, um, is that if you're a consultant and you're doing consultant-based uh, work for an organization that is important, which you know so many people are doing, that means you're performing in a critical role if you, we could show that for that organization. So you don't have to be directly employed by the organization in order to qualify under the criterion. You simply have to perform in that critical role. So um, just, just it reminds me of one thing, if you could bear with me. The, um, if you look at the way the present administration is um, analyzing these cases, or, you know, they're obviously they're giving it a little bit more scrutiny, but the real change took place in that they are taking what's called a plain language analysis. They want to, you must meet the plain language of the statute. Whereas in the past, they would look at, um, you know, the totality of the circumstances. Here, they're looking at just the plain language of the statute. So if the plain language of the statute says that the alien must perform in a critical capacity, it means simply that they must have performed or done some work contribution or, or, or uh, it's, it's not... Uh, simply just employed or contracted. It's that they've performed. So I think that actually gives more flexibility. So, you know, part of the uh, skill of an attorney is to kind of use, you know, we, we look at the government does and we have to, um, you know, adapt our approach in order to make sure that our, our clients' interests are being served. Exactly. And this is where it makes a big difference. And I, I'm getting a lot of calls where people are basically telling us how is it happening because we tried and we fail. Oh, uh, how come you guys are going to do something different? Well, this is the this is the thing, and I wanted to to point that. And by the way, for people who need help, give us a call at five one zero seven four two five eight eight seven, or you can visit our website at piralilaw dot com or just attorneyonair dot com. And I have with me today Sharif Silmi, attorney with our Washington office. And uh, Sharif is with us uh, helping uh, on all the EB1. He's actually in charge of the department. And now, luckily, we have Sharif in the Bay Area to help. So, And that becomes a big asset uh, instead of focusing on Washington, D.C., we're focusing on the Bay Area itself. And I think we can handle a lot of those cases, and I'm very proud. So now, Sharif, let's move to National Interest Waiver. I know for people from India, National Interest Waiver might not be that attractive, but at the end of the day, having an I-140 approved to a national interest waiver is also good because it allows them, if they, especially if they don't have what we call a, another I-140 to extend their H-1B, or ultimately, if the days become current, they get their own green card without having to go to an employer. So um, I don't know if you had a chance to, to, I think you work on a few of those national interest waiver, although you have been focusing on EB-1. Uh, do you have a chance? Can you tell us a little bit about national interest Sure, sure. I think, I mean, the key for national interest waiver, obviously, is that you don't need a labor certification. So um, you can, again, self-petition. 
and demonstrate your um, you know abilities, your strengths, your your meeting the criteria uh, individually without an employer. So that's I think really the the most important thing to note off the top. Um, but yeah, I mean as Shaw said, I mean this is really important to a lot of people in order to make sure that you know especially if they're an H one B that they could continue. Um, you know one one thing I think if you look at the uh, the more recent case law on this. Um, we we really need to ultimately the case is going to come down to whether the interest of um, having the person remain in the U.S. and continue to work in the U.S. Um, over uh, becomes stronger than the interest in having a labor certificate um, for the government to have a labor certificate done. So basically to protect protect U.S. workers. So I think that uh, one approach I've seen and uh, works very well. Is um, and this isn't for everyone, but I think if you're in this class of individuals, you should absolutely apply for national interest waiver, and that is where they work for a company or agency that, as a matter of policy, does not sponsor foreign workers. So I've had such cases where, for instance, a person worked for a state agency, and that state agency just, as a policy, doesn't sponsor foreign workers. So in that case, the person is doing important work. And you have the absolute best reason for not getting a labor certificate, and that's because your company doesn't give labor doesn't apply uh, for labor certification. So just as a kind of you know um, initial thing, if you're in that situation, you should absolutely contact you know our office and make sure that you know you file for national interest waiver because that's your basic that's your ticket right there. Um, you know uh, beyond that. You know, it's important to know that national interest waiver is a lot easier to meet than EB1A. Um, you know, there are only two of uh, six uh, criterion that are that are usually you know there, and also you have a lot more I think um, relevance for your educational background than in EB1A, where it's mostly based on your professional work. So, um, just overall, I think you're because one of the factors that you uh, need to analyze is that you are well positioned. To perform the, um, you know, the the, the area of uh, national merit. So you work in an area of national merit, and then you have to demonstrate that you are personally well prepared, um, that you have the tasks, the, the skills, the knowledge to perform in that area of national uh, merit. And then lastly, that that there's a good reason not to get a labor certificate. So so ultimately, I think that uh, that you should you should definitely go for it if you're. In a situation where you cannot get uh, employer uh, certified sponsorship, and again, the main another thing which is interesting, just like EB one A national interest waiver doesn't require an employer. We have done if you care, uh, one of the case I personally kind of uh, handled with uh, with the team was uh, the case we had for someone working with NASA and. And we have been successful with that. And we had a bunch of other cases where um, I remember a case for someone who was a reporter from Pakistan. And uh, we had also another, few. we have a bunch of cases, but I'm the one that I always remember because those were the tough ones. But we have done a lot of them. And, and I'm very proud to say we have a very, very good track record on that. And now with Sharif, we have a better track record. And I really, really wanted to thank him because many of those cases you see coming out been excellent and also IDT who is also uh, in our office who have she has done an excellent job also with those cases so um, Sharif tell me a little bit I think we have another five more minutes to go so I wanted to quickly you tell me uh, what will you advise uh, what advice but at least recommend people on the radio uh, to do if they feel like they have a, a, a potential of EB1 or national interest waiver what is the best what do you need quickly from them uh, so that we can at least do a quick evaluation and then move to the next step. Sure, sure. I think, first of all, you need to really think about your personal, uh, I'm sorry, your professional profile. Think really deeply about your profession, uh, what you've done in, in your work life, and then my word always is polish it off. Polish it off, put it on a resume, put it on a CV, and send it to us. Let me look at your CV uh, let's have a conversation, have a consultation set up, and, and you know, make that investment if, if that's uh, if you're if you're a candidate for that, and, and see what you could do because you you really never know. Like I said, there was a situation where where a person was turned away 11 times for contacting us, 
and she was approved without even RFE. So there's ways to do this. Um, you you have to really understand this area of law before you can, um, you know, uh, to, to really make that determination. And, and that's why having a consultation with a lawyer is really important. Um, the, the other thing I would say is, is there is flexibility in the criterion. And, and that those criterion alone don't determine whether or not you, you're going to qualify for EB1A. The, the, the most important thing is you're going to make a, a, a benefit, a future prospective benefit to the U.S., and also that you're going to continue to work in your field. So it's not only uh, demonstrating sustained claim through the, the 10 criterion. It's it's also um, a broader, you know, thematic approach that needs to be done. So so I guess, um, you know, one thing I like to tell my clients is that it's part science, but it's mostly art. So, so let the artists do their work. Exactly. And then also, of course, we don't have that much time now to go, but... I uh, wanted to say that we also have helped people with EB1C. This is another thing that many people... Can you quickly cover EB1C, which is the, the green card for L1A, but you don't have to be an L1A. Quickly cover that and let people know what can be done so that we they, they know it's possible or not. Sure, sure. I mean, so EB1C is for a multinational executive or manager. Um, it's, a, again, first preference immigration petition, so you're not going to be stuck in the EB2Q. Um, you know, for, for very long. And the, the requirements are that you, you have been employed outside the United States for one of the three years preceding uh, entry into the U.S. And you're employed by a firm or company that's seeking to enter the U.S. Um, to, to open or ex already exists in the U.S. So as uh, Shaw was alluding to, you don't necessarily have to come to the U.S. on L1A. You simply have to have worked for one of uh, the three years preceding your entry to the U.S. So, for example, if you worked for, let's say, you know, uh, General Electric India uh, for, uh, you know, one, a minimum of one of three years in a managerial position, and then you come to the U.S. for a different reason, let's say maybe you came to do your Ph.D. or some, something, or you came to work in a different company, and then you get an opportunity to work at that same company you worked for in India that has an office or, uh, you know, headquarters uh, in the U.S., then you can uh, file under EB1C. And it could really be any company. It doesn't have to be, you know, a, a large organization. It could be, for instance, um, you know, we've done this with uh, a company that was a broker of nuts. So that company uh, has three or four employees in India, they wanted to uh, start a branch office in the United States, having worked, uh, you know, one of three years there. They they were able to do that. So there's there's uh, lots of different ways, but um, the point is, if you're already in the U.S. and you've worked uh, one of three years preceding your entry into the U.S. for an organization that you could now work for in the U.S., then that's absolutely an opportunity for EB1C, and you need to look at that situation. Exactly. So, Sharif, I think we have only two more minutes to go, so could you give us a quick uh, conclusion what you will recommend people to do if they feel, um, if they are not sure or they want to go ahead, what sh they should at least send us to work with or contact yeah. us to yeah. work with? Sure, sure. I think just, I mean, if I could use this time to talk a little bit more about ED1A, because I think that's the area where there's so many sure, misconceptions sure, out there. There's, there's, first of all, a lot of the information you read on the Internet with all due respect to, you know, those websites, um, you know, I, I don't want to name names, but uh, it, it, there's misinformation out there. It's, it's not correct. You really need to look at what does the statute say, what does the law say, and what does a lawyer going to tell you, because every case is unique and every case is different. So, um, and, and the other thing I would caution people against is do not depend on your company counsel, because your company counsel, they're... Uh, duty as lawyers is to the company. It's not to you as an employee. So you need to find your own uh, independent counsel to represent your interests. So please, I mean, with all due respect to those companies, it's, those lawyers aren't doing anything bad. They're doing their job. Frankly, if I was a company uh, uh, attorney, I would be looking out for the company as well. But, you know, thankfully, I'm in a position where I represent, you know, hardworking individuals. So that's the people I look out for. So uh, just make sure you, you get your own independent counsel and don't just 
go where the wind blows and, and follow, uh, you know, non-attorney advice as well. So thank you so much, Sharif, for being with us today. And hopefully we will get you next week or the week after to call uh, to talk a little bit about other visas we have not talked about. And today the focus was on EV1, ladies and gentlemen. And as Sharif has mentioned, it is very important that you check with the attorney, uh, with an attorney. And the truth is that not every attorney, because now we're getting calls from other attorneys to work on cases because they are not able to find how to do that, the, those cases. So the truth is, it's 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 just like any anything, right? So, so you have ten doctors or you have ten lawyers. Not everybody is equal, unfortunately. So just because you went to another lawyer, he said no, doesn't mean the second lawyer will say yes. Or you need to make sure also the lawyer has good reputation because someone can say yes, just take your money, and then that will not work. So this is important too. And thank you again, Sharif. And I hope I will get you back maybe to talk about E2 and other visas soon. And just to let people know, for national interest waiver, it's an EB2. If you are born outside India, for example. Well, you might be Indian, but you were born outside. You might be able to take advantage of that. So thank you so much, Sharif. I hope to see you soon in the office. So take care. Thank you, Sharif. Take care. Take care. So ladies and gentlemen, now we are, we are almost done. I just wanted to thank you all for listening to the show. And before I, I, I pass the, this to to um, to Amit, I, I just wanted to recap today was EB1. And number two, if you need help, even an H1B, give us a call, 510-742-5887. And uh, the website, attorneyonair.com, attorneyonair.com. And also, I wanted to talk about about uh, about debt settlement quickly. If you need help with your credit cards, second mortgages, etc., uh, etc., et please feel free to call us at 510-742-5887. The, the blog to check on this is yourdebtsettlementattorney.com, yourdebtsettlementattorney.com. We can help you get rid of your second mortgages sometimes. Not that many now, but many times is, uh, is credit cards, etc. So, ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to thank you. And again, thanks to Reef for, for having explained all those petitions, which has always been a confusion. And he sees it in a different angle, and I wanted him to be both. Just to let you know, Sharif is with us. Uh, we're on the same team, so anytime you call us, he we can we can actually have him assess your case. The number is five one zero seven four two five eight eight seven. Only me and him assesses. Uh, we do assess all the EB one and national interest waiver cases. Again, five one zero seven four two five eight eight seven. Anything I told you today again is for educational purposes only. You should not act or refrain to act solely on the information provided. You should contact an attorney if you have any questions. Attorneyonair.com. Thank you, and I think I mean you have seven minutes to go so thank you Amit. sure thank you sir thank you take care goodbye yep thank you uh thank you everyone and uh thank you Shah and uh sister call other notes to everyone uh, this is your bay area realtor amit uh, gambir and your tax expert from uh, business tax solutions uh <clears throat> sorry i have very little time and uh, uh i'm going to try to i mean uh, i give you just uh, some uh synopsis and uh, let you know what's happening with the, the market right now and uh, so that way, if you have any question, you can call me. Uh, number to call me is 510-299-9361. It's very kind of uh, rainy, you know, season, so stay dry and be safe while you're driving. So, you know, don't text and drive because uh, the conditions are very, very bad out there. So make sure, you know, I mean, uh, think about your family first and then, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, drive safely. So on the other hand, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's tax season right now, and if you want to taxes, you want to get your taxes done. To see, like, so step by okay, you know, I mean, should I do it? Should I not do it? Uh, you are actually, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, working with somebody who can help you out in uh, getting it done on time. You can definitely give me a call. I can help you out. I see taxes we are doing Anything that has to do with the taxes, whether uh, you know. <clears throat> W2 file karwana hai ga, 1099 karwana hai ga, uh, corporation hai ga, you want to get the corporate taxes done, we can help you out with everything on that part. The Saturday day cost hai is very, very uh, cost effective, it's not, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, too high. Per W2, I am charging only $75, which is per W2. So 75 bucks per W2, and then per 1099 form, I am charging $100 only to file the taxes. On top of that corporation, uh, they did a charges again, it's $250 that I'm charging uh, to file the corporate taxes. 
and obviously the time has already passed but if you have filed extension and you have the paperwork ready you can call me and i can help you out with that on top of that if you want to form any llc or any uh, you know corporation for yourself uh, we can definitely help you out in that as well and for accounting and bookkeeping uh, i can uh, definitely take care of that for you as well and we are only charging eighteen hundred dollars for the whole year so these are like very very i mean you know i um, mean uh, uh, good pricing for you so that way it's not breaking your pocket plus Asadi AI Koshir and they give you trying to get you the best refund possible based on the numbers you're going to provide and whatever is going to be on your uh, taxes uh, you know if there's any carryovers or anything or uh, from previous years and uh, the other thing you need to make sure is you make sure you're claiming your foreign uh, accounts as well you know if you have anything over $10,000 uh, you know in in uh, in foreign accounts so we can definitely uh, take care of that part as well for you there is no extra cost uh, to do the uh, foreign uh, f bars uh, from our site but uh, we can definitely take care of that for you on that one so again like i said this is a tax time and if you do want to get it done give me a call number again is 510-299-9361 as a sada jada office hai guys in fremont and uh, you know we can take care of it and get it done for you in timely manner and uh, the last day to file the taxes is april 15th and this is uh, you know a great way to get it done with us because agar tusi makan vi khareedna hai ga you are planning to purchase a house it's going to help you out you know uh, both